Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. We've always wanted to get community input, so... We intend to give it a a good amount of weight. One of the lowest ranked things was continue to fund things like COVID contact tracing. People just seemed like they were over it. Yeah. What's your take on that? Uh, That's unfortunate. Um, In this year's budget, we boosted the um, uh, budget for our health department, and we're going to be hiring more epidemiologists and nurses uh, to make sure that not only are we still tracking COVID, but other uh, infectious diseases as well. So this is one where you're not going to follow the survey on, safe Absolutely to say. not. Okay. <laughs> we are not gutting public health. It doesn't matter what the people want. No, we're not. <laughs> I'm Sarah Fetsky. For St. Louis Mayor Tashara Jones, the results are in. The city set out to survey residents and other stakeholders about how it should spend an unprecedented windfall. And we're not talking about the Rams money. In addition to the $500 million the city will share with the county and the Dome Authority from that litigation, the city was allotted nearly $500 million in COVID relief funds. $249 million of those dollars are still unappropriated. And now 4200 and 15 locals have weighed in on how that money should be spent. And joining us now to share her thoughts on those results and what comes next is St. Louis Mayor Tashara Jones. So, Mayor Jones, welcome back. Thank you for having me and happy last day. Or is, yes. that, is that a good sentiment? Happy last happy day? Happy last day, bittersweet last bittersweet day. Bittersweet last day. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be very hard to give up this mic, but I'm enjoying it while I can. Right. <laughs> and I'm eager to talk to you about some of the stuff going on at City Hall. These survey results, you got a lot of people to fill out this survey. Is that number roughly what you'd been hoping for? Yes, we want to try to get as many people to fill out the survey as possible. And we realized that a lot of people don't have online access, so we would take it with us uh, on the road to you know paper surveys to churches, to rec centers, to senior citizen buildings, uh, to try to get as much input as we can, because that has been a staple of, of my administration since I was sworn in about all over a year ago. So this survey, even with those efforts, it does skew a bit white. 67% of respondents were white. 58% were female. Um, Mm. So people like me, very well represented Mm. in this survey. Mm -hmm. Are you worried that it offers a skewed perspective? Well, that wasn't the only way we got uh, input. We also did town halls and roundtables as well. We did two town halls, one in North St. Louis, one in South St. Louis, uh, that drew more than 200 people from the from the city, and so we wanted to make sure that we were, you know, trying to reach people where they are in as many ways as as we could. So you feel like you've gotten the feedback that you were hoping for to, to figure out. Okay, here's what the people want. Now you have to decide how much weight to give that. So before exactly. we dig into the results, how much weight do you intend to give this? Uh, we intend to give it a, a good amount of weight. Uh, you know, uh, this is uh, something where again we have. We've always wanted to get community community input. So, um, and and the people are gonna. We have to meet people where they are, and we want them to tell us uh, how they how their government can work for them, not the other way around. So you started with some big categories, like which of these things are most important to you, and it seemed like the winner on that was neighborhood transformation. And in that case, they seem to be talking about things related to the built environment. They want to see vacant homes addressed, mm-hmm. um, torn down if need be, fixed mm-hmm. up if not. They want to see potholes addressed. I know you already put a lot of money into potholes. Right. Are you going to continue to spend more money on that built environment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the American Rescue Plan isn't the only way that we can address that. We still have uh, grants and loans that are going to be available through the bipartisan infrastructure law. A lot of those programs are starting to come into fruition. Uh, we're starting to get uh, notices of funds availability for several of the programs that had to be stood up through the Department of Transportation, uh, EPA, to name a couple 
of uh, or uh, of uh, depart- federal departments. So thinking about this idea that people really want their neighborhood transformed, I think so many of us city residents were so devoted to these communities where we live, the people in them, and, mm-hmm. and wanting them to be better. What do you see as as the best way, sort of armed with this survey, that we can put these ARPA funds to use? Right. So we have, um, we you know, the last time we were here, we talked about the economic justice uh, roadmap uh, that we uh, we revealed uh, during the State of the City address. Mm-hmm. Um, and during the State of the City address, I made a $150 million commitment to North St. Louis uh, for neighborhood transformation, for infrastructure improvement, for workforce development. Um, and those are the things that transform our communities. We have to take care of the people and the built environment. Um, and so we're also using that as a, as a down payment because we're going to try to attract more private and philanthropic dollars because, you know, everybody has to be at the table and be invested in improving our city because we cannot expect it to succeed if over half of it is left to fail. One of the other big things that people said is they want to see infrastructure um, that will create safety to make the city safer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And one of the top things on that, they want to see the 911 system working fully. Yes. I know that was already a priority of yes. yours. It was a priority, Mayor Krusen said, of hers when she was mm-hmm. there. Are we at the point where that needs more ARPA funds or is that – it, where it needs ARPA funds in the first place, mm-hmm. or is that something that it's it's on the mend? This has been addressed. It, it, it has not been fully addressed yet. There are some things that, that are uh, definitely on the horizon there. We want to have what's called a public safety access point, which is combining all of our dispatchers into one place for fire, EMS, and police uh, to cross-train them. Um, then we also have alternative response, which is a key piece of that, to make sure that we're deploying the right resource to the right call. Um, and so we we're, we're still moving forward on that. There are a lot of negotiations that have to happen when you're taking a system that has been there for a long time and trying to do something new. But we're committed to this process, and I, and I believe we're going to see it through. And is that something where the American Rescue Plan Act dollars could come in handy? Yes, yeah, some of it has. Some of it has. I, I believe we have uh, allocated um, maybe a couple of million dollars to at least start the process uh, with, with, with what we call the public safety access point. There was also stated in this survey a big desire for year-round programs to help youth, to help them train for jobs seemed to be a big thing, whether that's apprenticeship or or workforce training programs. Is that something where you see infusing existing programs, or we may be looking at a new program? Um, I think we have a lot of existing programs that I think we can um, make sure that uh, we're standing those programs up, making sure that they have the resources they need to continue. You know, you have St. Louis youth, Youth Jobs. We have programs available through Slate or the St. Louis Agency for Training and Employment. Um, So we're really trying to make sure that their programs are as robust and reaching as many uh, of our children as possible. And then also our rec centers play a key piece here. Mm -hmm. So we're putting uh, some ARPA dollars towards uh, improving our rec centers and making sure that um, that our our children and young people have a place that's safe and up to date uh, to play and learn and grow. And what about the kids zero through five? That was another priority. I saw a mm-hmm. lot of people checked mm-hmm. that they'd like to see some support for that. Yes. Yeah, so the, our first round of ARPA, I believe we sent uh, uh, several million dollars towards uh, uh, to the mental health board to then be distributed to our early childhood uh, education providers. Um, and that is still on the table for our second tranche as well. So something that ranked very low couldn't help but catch my attention. (laughs) When we talk about the broad categories where you're saying, okay, where do you want the city to most focus? Public health did not do so well in that. And then when you drill down into the public health category, what subcategories inside of this do you want to see resources going into? Um, One of the lowest ranked things was continue to fund things like COVID contact tracing. People just seemed like they were over it. Yeah. What's your take on that? Uh, that's unfortunate. As someone who has a, a, deg- a master's degree in health administration, um, I am always trying to pay attention to how public health intersects with everything that we do in government. Um, so in this year's budget, we boosted the um, uh, budget for our health department, and we're going to be hiring more ep- epidemiologists and nurses uh, to make sure that not only are we still tracking COVID, but other uh, infectious diseases as well. Because as we know, our our 
health department director uh, is an infectious disease specialist. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, St. Louis is top of the list on some of our uh, infectious diseases and STDs. So um, it's important that we fund that work uh, and and support our health director in that work. So this is one where you're not going to follow the survey on, safe to say. Absolutely (laughs) not. We are not gutting public health. It doesn't matter what the people want. No, we're not. (laughs) I did notice in that public health category, even though that wasn't a top priority for a whole bunch of people, within the public health category, people wanted more options for mental health treatment, 30 percent support. That was a really high percentage among all the subcategories in Mm -hmm. this. And that seems like it's such an issue across the nation right now. Can the city be doing more on that? I think historically it's been considered a a state or a federal project to focus on that. Well, I'm interested to see what happens uh, with the Senate bill that's currently making its way through through the federal government. This Um, is the bipartisan one that also addresses guns. Right, exactly, uh, because they have... um, put in a lot of money for um, for mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if they're going to try to expand mental health resources, I think everybody benefits uh, because you, we have to address mental health like your physical health. Mm-hmm. Um, but we all know that, uh, you know, the that some of, with some of the uh, mass shootings, it wasn't a mental health issue. It was availability of weapons issue. Um, but that's another story for another day. And these are both stories that St. Louis has to deal with every day. Yes. And I know that's something where you feel like your your hands are tied in many ways. State law yeah. um, has facilitated a lot of guns in the city. They but, preempt us all the time. Yeah. And, you know, they've been relaxing gun laws since 2007, and it has not made us safer. And it's frankly hypocritical for, uh, for people to point their fingers at cities and say, well, you're not doing anything about your crime, but you're making guns available everywhere. So you look at states where you have a Republican governor who who loves the Second Amendment, but you have Democratic mayors uh, that are mayors of these urban cities, and our hands are tied because you're making guns available everywhere, but you want us to do something about crime. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about the crime that happens person to person. It also makes our first responders less safe. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a huge issue that you're Mm -hmm. dealing with, and you're dealing with it every day. Yes, absolutely. Unfortunately. We're talking today to St. Louis Mayor Tashara Jones. The city has survey results in. More than 4,200 people weighed in on the survey of how to spend these ARPA funds. We do have a link to the complete dashboard the city's put together on our website. That's stlonair.show. Really interesting what people want. And as the mayor says, this is going to provide something of a guidepost as, as it figures out its next move. There's also some real questions as we talk about this federal spending or the federal money that's coming into the city. We're now seeing three aldermen who are under indictment. Um, They have since resigned their positions. The city had previously earmarked $37 million for economic development in Northside Corridors using this same federal funding. The way those grants were set up, it required the support of the aldermen to do that. We've now seen the dangers of that with these three aldermen being indicted. Is that something that you think you'll go back and revise that provision. Yes, we do have an intention to re- to uh, go in back and amending that provision. Um, we also had conversations with the U.S. Department of Treasury on that. Uh, they also uh, flagged that as a possibility for conflict of interest. And now that we have this unfortunate situation on their hands, I think this is the time to do so. That was President Lewis Reed, um, something that he really wanted. And you guys had clashed on that. He ended up getting his way. He's now resigned. Yes. You guys had a complicated relationship. Yes, we did. Um, Do you feel like this presents some opportunity to clean up some things you wanted to clean up, regardless of whatever happens with the criminal case against him, that without him there, you're going to be able to push through some things you had hoped to push through? Well, first, I want to say that, um, you know, uh, President Reed and uh, with uh, President Reed, Jeffrey Boyd and John Collins Muhammad, their families continue to be in my prayers because I've been there. I know what that feels like to love someone unconditionally, even when they haven't always done the right thing. Um, but I do believe that uh, this is an opportunity for us to restore trust and integrity in our local government. Um, and so I have been working with uh, the interim president, Joe Vollmer, on um, what we can what we can work on together. Uh, our first several meetings have been, you know, extremely pleasant. Um, and he has said that, hey, I'm just here to keep the trains running. But he is also committed to restoring trust and int- integrity in our local government. And I think this is an op- opportunity to do that. And as such, you know, we're looking at 
you know, hopefully there'll be some uh, legislation introduced to address this, uh, to address incentive reform uh, going forward. Because the things that we want to see, we want to improve transparency. We want community input on large scale projects. And we want to eliminate the conflict of interest because development needs to be driven by the community, not by politics. Yeah. So these indictments made clear just how messed up the process was for getting tax abatements. And this is something that um, a lot of your most loyal supporters have been talking about for Mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. Progressives have wanted to change Mm -hmm. how tax abatements are handed out in the city. But beyond just how they take money away from the schools and some of the systemic problems, this just shows how easily they can be abused. Do you think there is a way that the city can put some safeguards in place to stop the kind of abuse that's portrayed in these indictments, but continue to still have abatements to encourage development where you really want to encourage development. Yes, I absolutely think so. Um, You know, Neil Richardson, who's the new head of SLDC, had been working on incentive reform before these indictments had even come to to come to light. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we were trying to make sure that we uh, put together a process where um, it was objective that the that the the developments would be judged on their merit um, and the but for test and including community benefit agreements, um, uh, inclusionary zoning for affordable housing, addressing the things that our city really needs, not necessarily addressing the uh, uh, pockets of wealthy developers. So is this something where you're hoping for the St. Louis uh, Development Corporation to take the lead, that they are going to determine um, which developments, which proposals should get tax abatement rather than that be something driven by the individual aldermen? Right. We have to we have to take all of those things into, into uh, consideration, but no longer can we uh, have a process where the uh, where the older person is the has the ultimate veto authority. Um, it has to be something that's done with community, not to community. So for the interim board president, um, you know, Joel Vormer has said he's there to keep the, the trains running. Is he interested in that kind of, which would be a pretty big reform for how St. Louis operates? Does he want to see that happen on his watch? Um, it would be huge. Uh, so we're having those conversations. Um, like I said, he's only been on the job for two weeks. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> and he'll tell you it's not a job he wanted. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but uh, we'll continue need to have conversations with him and the other alders on on, on what uh, what moves forward. So he is not closing the door. He's not trying to kick this down the road to say we need to have a permanent president before we can have these discussions. I don't think he's trying to kick the kick the can down the uh, proverbial can down the road. Um, but we also have to realize that the board goes down uh, July 15th and doesn't come back until September. And there's a board president race in the middle of all of this as well. <laughs> so St. Louis. <laughs> so St. Louis. Right? <laughs> so do you think there's a chance you can get this through, these kind of reforms that you guys are now talking about this? Could this happen um, before that adjournment in July? I don't think it'll happen before the adjournment in July, um, but that gives us the summer to have the conversation, to have many conversations with with, uh, with stakeholders, with developers, with community, with um, our business uh, business owners to see what, uh, what a good process would look like going forward. So I spoke to a friend who's a developer soon after this, the news of these indictments came out. And he said, this is just really frustrating because this is going to make good developers not want to do business in the city, that they're going to assume that they have to pay somebody off to get a fair shake. Are you worried that this could end up being the reputation, even though we need this kind of cleanup and reform? Uh, that people are going to be concerned that it's just too hard to even get a level playing field. I I, I think that this levels the playing field. This is an opportunity for us to level the playing field. So um, so your smaller developers get as much attention uh, to their projects as your larger developers. And 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 we know that that hasn't always been been the case. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that we um, uh, make a uh, create an environment where everyone feels that their project has a chance. So we only have a few more minutes here today. Mm -hmm. The time has just flown, and there's a few things I wanted to make sure to ask you about. One of them has to do with the expansion of the light rail system. This is something that you'd like to make happen. Mm -hmm. I noticed on the survey that didn't do so well either. (laughs) Only 13% of the people said this would be a priority for them to do a big project like that. What makes you still bullish on light rail when Lyda Krusen maybe had a more, you know, she wanted to look at other options, things like bus rapid transit, things that she thought were better cost per mile? Well, um, we also have an opportunity, again, through the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, through the New Starts program, through the Department of Transportation. So that 
didn't exist in the Cruz administration. Um, so with all of the federal programs that we have access to and the federal funds that we have access to, I think we have to strike while the iron is hot. So this would be an additional pot of federal funding, even beyond the money we're talking about through this survey. Yes, yes. And that current route that we're looking at, which looks like it would go down Jefferson mm-hmm. uh, towards the NGA, you have a good feeling about that. I do, I do. We want to make sure that we are connecting people to jobs. And so it goes you know, from North St. Louis past the NGA all the way down to South St. Louis. So that's a North Route connector that we've needed for a long time. So another thing that has generated a lot of discussion in the city lately, and that is um, what has been posed as a temporary ban on electric scooters downtown. Mm -hmm. Uh, We spoke to Alderman James Page, and the first weekend after this was rolled out, he was saying, boy, he felt like this had been a pretty good weekend. It Mm -hmm. made him even more open to this going forward. Other people have said, hey, this is going to hurt tourists. This is unfairly penalizing kids who don't really have much else to do. How is downtown the problem? Isn't there some way we could fine-tune this so we're dealing with troublemakers, not just banning microtransit? Well, I think you just answered the question. That's not our only option. That's not our only strategy here. Um, That is part of a a, a multi-pronged strategy to address um, the options for fun and safe activities for our youth, um, not only in downtown, but all across St. Louis. So the Downtown Engagement and Public Safety Initiative does just that. Um, We are uh, increasing our public safety presence when necessary, but also trying to make sure that we um, work together to provide fun and safe activities for our young people um, on the weekends as as they come downtown or any place around around the city. Do you see this ban, uh, like the geofencing that blocks the e-scooters from working downtown? Is that something that you're going to give some time, see how it plays out? Yes, absolutely. We have to give it time and see how it plays out. I, I know the initial response um, to the downtown banning of scooters uh, has been positive, uh, but uh, but we'll we'll continue to monitor it. Do you feel hopeful about downtown right now? I'm very bullish on downtown right now. There are some other things that are going on, um, uh, other plans that we have that I think uh, we have to bring downtown back. And so, um, but, and and also want to let your listeners know, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can we can bring town, downtown back and our other neighborhoods at the same time. Boy, it feels like there's a lot going on right now, just hearing all the things people want the city to do as contained in the results of this survey. And then on top of it, trying to reform some processes What would you say is your biggest priority for the next six months? Um, For the next six months, I would say my biggest priority is um, uh, the things we've talked about. You know, we have an opportunity for some real incentive reform. Um, uh, We have an opportunity to, you know, still concentrate on our public safety initiatives and make sure that uh, we're still seeing uh, 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 some, uh, some good headway there. And I think we are. Um, And also uh, 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 taking the information that we have from the survey to put together uh, some good pieces of legislation with the Board of Aldermen uh, to get this money out in the community. Well, St. Louis Mayor Tashara Jones, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Today's episode was produced by Sarah Fenske with audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our production intern is Avery Rogers. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. Our podcast proudly supports St. Louis artists by using music from Life Creative Group. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com.